everything you want it's on the other side of here. Hey there, my name is Mester Catalina and you're listening to I Love Failure, the podcast where I talk to people about professional failures and what they learn from them. The I Love Failure movement started with an idea, to change people's relationship with failure. Since then we had many sold out events where people get on stage and talk about professional failures with a room full of people. This week I sit down with Jay Malone. He is the founder and principal facilitator of New Haircut, an innovation strategy firm and global leader in problem framing and design sprints. Jay supports teams inside Prudential, Home Depot, P&G and Rosetta Stone. He has also produced several design thinking community favorites such as Design Sprint and Problem Framing Toolkits, the Facilitation Mini Course, the Innovation Leadership Accelerator and the world's favorite design sprint app, Duco. I think the biggest failure or the biggest room for growth, depending on how you want to look at it, was putting all of my eggs in new haircut. So I, I spent seven years working so almost like single focused on building the company that ultimately it cost me my marriage. Um, mm-hmm. And it eventually it cost me my partnership with my business partner. Um, so in the span of about two years, I got divorced. I lost my business partner um, and I was definitely like at a really low spot. And just at the lowest spot, my house caught on fire and I had to live in an apartment for a year or so. So it was almost like... Before we begin this week's episode, I would like to thank MySpace for hosting this podcast. If you're looking for flexible office spaces for companies of any size, MySpace is the place for you. Also, if you want to support the Isle of Failure movement, you can go to isleoffailure.co slash support. That's isleoffailure.co slash support, where you can become a Patreon or buy cool merchandise. Thank you and enjoy the show. The short story is uh, I had an idea to build a product um, back in 2008 while I was still working on Wall Street. And I reached out to a, a, I reached out to a bunch of firms to try to get that. It was a, a digital experience. It was going to be an e-commerce platform. And I had an idea to build it and I was looking for people to help build it. And I went through, I interviewed about 50 firms and I had a really poor experience of trying to find a firm that I felt was going to really hear me, challenge my ideas and ultimately build something that was going to do well in the market. And uh, because of that, I found a firm, uh, actually a firm based in Timisoara, Romania, which is how I've come to know so much about Romania and the experience was unlike any I'd I'd been through. And I was so excited about the idea of helping other entrepreneurs like myself build their experiences and and apps and and mobile platforms and things of that nature that I decided it would be a a fun idea to go into business as providing that kind of service. Um, And so I started a company with, with the guy who built my, my e-commerce platform. And we opened after about a year of experimenting and figuring out what the partnership would look like. We opened for business in 2010 as a product design and development studio, but a lot's changed since then. Yeah, I figured. And uh, until then uh, you were like doing the corporate lifestyle. What, what did you do? I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, I was a, well, I started as a software engineer. I went to school for bio for biology and environmental science, because I thought I was going to save the planet. And then when I realized that the planet is uh, either going to survive or not survive with or without me, um, I got excited about writing compu- I, about writing code, which is a strange turn from being pre-med and thinking I was going to be a doctor or an environmental biologist. I took, I signed up for um, a course after college, after going through a four year college and paying all sorts of money to the college, I then decided to spend more money to learn how to write code. And um, Accenture happened to be recruiting a couple people that were out of that course. And I happened to be one of them. I was fortunate enough to be one of two people that they recruited, recruited out of the course. And I spent the next almost seven years working at Accenture. And I was a little bit of an oddball there because I like to write code. I think many people join Accenture to become a, a sales partner and just go in a different, maybe sort of business direction. But I actually like the art and sort of the, the science behind writing code and solving problems. And so I, I became a software engineer 
and that's how I started my career. And then as um, what I learned is that um, I enjoyed not just writing code, but talking with the person in marketing that had the ideas about what they were asking me to build for them. And so I became this person that would bounce around between technology and sales and marketing and research. And I would sort of be bridging all these conversations to try to figure out what people are actually trying to get built. So we wanted to see the big picture of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. What I was doing was I was being a product manager, but it wasn't called product manager back then. It was called, you were, I was called a business analyst but I also would do project management. So I had a, a strange role. Now I would be called a product manager. Um, yeah, and that I think became the sort of the foundation and sort of the backbone that allowed me to open up new haircut. So just because I had that experience of what it was like for engineers and product people to take ideas from entrepreneurs and companies and businesses and turn those into digital experiences. Great. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> was it hard to jump ship like from the corporate pay paycheck to paycheck to paycheck uh, to the, you know, taking this chance on, on a startup, starting the entrepreneurial journey? Well, yes, yes and no. So um, I had been thinking about it for probably three years. So I was working in corporate after Accenture. I went into a small startup in Manhattan. <clears throat> and then I moved to another technology company off of Wall Street. And, uh, but during the last two jobs for many, much of that time, I was thinking about making a jump and starting my own thing. I just had ideas about how businesses should be run. Um, I felt like decisions took too long to get made. Um, so that was a, a great chance for me to learn things like agile and lean development, just to make things move quicker, to help make decisions, to make sure we're working on important problems. So I was learning all these things along the way in my job, but I felt like there were, there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of politics. There was a lot of um, risk mitigation um, and things just took a, a long time. And ultimately I, I got to a place where I wasn't really learning. I wasn't as inspired as I wanted to be with the people that I was working with and for. I became a little bit of a know-it-all in the process, but I, I had this vision of something that I wanted to build, whether it was a product or a business. I wasn't really quite sure what it was, but I had this, this sort of like entrepreneurial fire um, was burning in me. Both my parents own their own businesses. So for a few years, I was thinking about it and thinking about it. And then um, ultimately, I, went, I wound up the, the housing crisis hit in 2008. And so the market started to crumble. And I was one of the first people that lost my job in the company. And as I was thinking about cleaning up my resume and, and going and looking for another job, um, I stopped. I kind of like paused for a second and said, do I really want to do this again? Because I... I felt like I'd be right back in the same position a few years later. And instead I went out and just looked for contract jobs that I could get to sort of like, I felt like being a contractor was sort of this middle ground between having a job and owning a, a business with employees and, and salaries and benefits and all that stuff. So I, I 1099 myself, which is just to be a contractor in the States. And I started freelance um, offering freelance product management to a couple companies. And, uh, and then, the, so that was the hard part because it took a long time to have the courage to sort of get there. And then eventually being fired was the ultimate um, decision maker for me. And it, at the time, I think getting fired no matter what is traumatic for people. But as I looked back on it, even like a month later, I realized that it was the right time. And so I was, I was actually pretty fortunate to be let go um, and then the process began. I started, I started freelancing and, and, um, one opportunity turned into the foundation for a new haircut. It became an opportunity to build a platform for a new company. And the CEO sort of like took me under his wing and said, I believe in you. I'm going to invest in you. We're going to use you as our, as our vendor. And that became the first client of new haircut. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, how do you feel about luck in, in this process? I mean, were you lucky? Were you, do you believe in luck? What's, what's your stand on this? 
Well, I think, um, I think there's two ways to look at the things that happen around you. You can, and this is something that I've, I learned from the coaches that I work with. You can either be at effect of things that just happened to me, or you can be at cause for them. So I like to believe that I'm at cause for more and more, but being at cause is a double-edged sword because the more that requires you to be totally responsible and the more responsible you are, the harder it is to work through all the challenges that come, that come at you. Um, I think people like to use the expression that I'm, I'm fully responsible for my life, but when bad things happen, they like to point fingers and blame other people. But so re responsibility comes on both ends, both creating and dealing with the things that happen with you. So luck is, I think, something that you create. All right. You put yourself, you know, you put yourself in the right position and you, you yeah, but, uh, <clears throat> let's say you work very hard and another guy works as hard as you and he yeah. gets, you know, he gets the job or he gets, you know, the deal and you don't, I mean, something happened there. I mean, that's chance or whatever you want to call it. I mean, even if you put the same amount of energy, mm. there is some catalyst there. Maybe, I don't know. I'm, but you know, um, Probably there. I mean, someone might believe that I don't believe it because I think I've been on both sides of it um, for the first in terms of like the top, the, the, the theme of, of the podcast, I love failure. I think the first seven years of new haircut was filled with failure and filled with probably feeling like I was unlucky. I would lose opportunity after opportunity. I'd feel like it's not fair. This big company that has more money, more resources, better better people that know how to how to do sales i had never done sales in my life so i felt like it wasn't fair that i would lose opportunities but uh, now that i when i look back at them i realized that every opportunity i lost i i had a hand in losing that opportunity maybe i was nervous going into the meeting maybe it ultimately wasn't a good fit for what i knew we wanted to do so there was some some like pushback that i I kind of like pushed away from the opportunity as well. I think it's easy to blame the company that's looking at you or the people that work for you and say, this is the problem. But ultimately I think you can, you can really look, that's, that's hard because if you go about your whole life that way, then I think you're handing what happens to you. You're putting that in the hands of everybody else around you instead of kind of taking responsibility for it yourself. Yeah, yeah, right. Cool. So, uh, what was like the biggest failure that you had so far? I mean, one that it's the most important to you. I mean, that changed things for you. I don't know if you have one. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, look. You and I had talked a little bit about failure before this this conversation. Um, and I think it's what you do with failure, of course. Um, I know that that's the theme behind this. Like, what do we do with failure? What do we do? Because failure is just an outcome of change. And how do you react to that change? So right. being fired, I could have looked at as poor me. I didn't deserve to be fired. And I could have spent a lot of time like languishing there. And instead, yeah. within a month, I had a new opportunity and had the start of a new company. And I think that continued for the last 10 years. I mean, in the course of building my company, um, we scaled it up to 30 employees. We had, we were across three offices. Um, I did that all with a partner that I had only met a handful of times and that he and I were very different in terms of like our upbringing and the, our culture and our families. So there were many opportunities for me to blame that are like that we were just different people when we would lose opportunities or lose good good employees. Um, I think the biggest failure or the biggest room for growth, depending on how you want to look at it, was putting all of my eggs in new haircut. So I I spent seven years working so almost like single focused on building the company that ultimately it cost me my marriage. Um, mm -hmm. and it eventually it cost me my partnership with my business partner. Um, so in the span of about two years, I got divorced. 
I lost my business partner. Um, and I was definitely like at a really low spot and just at the lowest spot, my house caught on fire and I had to live in an apartment for a year or so. So it was almost like, um, they all came together. Like, like the it all came together. Like, and I, what I might've said a year ago is the universe was giving me a chance to start over. I think I actually forced all of that because I think I knew that I was doing something that ultimately didn't align with who I wanted to be as a person and what I wanted to build as a company and who I wanted to surround myself with. So I kind of just, I pushed it all away from me. I didn't do it in the most courageous way because like I hurt people along the way, but it did give me a chance. It gave me a chance to start completely over all over again, which has also been a, a huge challenge because today new haircut has nothing to do with the company that I started in 2010. Um, it's just me. So I don't have anyone that's earning. I can't look at anyone and say, you screwed up how the website looks or you lost that sales opportunity because I do everything. I operate the company. I sell it. I market it. I manage contracts. I do everything. So I would like some help, but I'm not in the position to hire anyone right now. So I think ultimately that's what I was wanting to do is to really be responsible for how a new haircut was built and shaped. And I didn't know how to do that. So I wound up pushing everything away that, that wasn't resonating with me. So it was a big challenge to like lose all those people that I loved and, and built a company with and start over. Yeah, damn, that sounds, sounds bad, man. <laughs> But uh, uh, I'm very, very curious. Uh, how how did you get back on your feet? I mean, how how do you stop wallowing and you know start start over? What's did you? I don't know. Do you have a process for that? Because a lot of people, including myself, I was homeless two times, so uh, I've done a lot of uh, stuff. But um, I'm very curious if you if you have some advice how to get over that hump, like. And especially when it comes, because I also lost the loved ones, I was always focused on my business. And um, how, how how can you handle that? Like get to terms with what happened. I call it owning your story, basically. When you own it, you're not ashamed to talk about it like you're doing now, like I'm doing. So that owning part of it, did it take a lot of time for you for, for this particular example to to happen? Yeah, I really like that, owning your story. Um, I like it because I think I spent a lot of time, I mean, I'm human, so I screw up. Um, I think the hardest part is being, is believing the stories that you make up, mostly about yourself. So you, you tell yourself that you're a failure, that you're not supposed to be a business owner, that you should just go get a job, that you're an imposter, and you believe it. And then on top of it, you go out and create things so that to prove that you're right, that you are a failure, right? So mm -hmm. you focus on the sales call that didn't go well, or you bring that energy into the sales call so that you can have a shitty sales call and then lose it and say, see, you're right. You were right all along. You should just go get a job. You're not fit for this. So you're validating yourself all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's just a story. And then what I do with my stories is I tell myself that I'm not good enough. And then as I beat myself up, I then go in and turn that against everybody that I'm surrounded by. So in order to feel better, I'll dominate other people. I'll be right and, and prove that they're wrong. And all that I'm doing is really like fracturing relationships. Yeah. So what I've, what I've learned to do is to just acknowledge that I'm human and that's something that we all do. Um, to be patient, really what it, the, the hardest work I think for me to do is just to be patient with myself and to be kind to myself as I screw up, just not to use it as an excuse to, to judge myself, which is really hard. I've been working on it for a couple of years with the support of a couple of coaches. So yeah. Getting help knowing being smart enough. Like I think, um, I don't want to stereotype, but I think men in general are really stubborn when it comes to asking for help. We yeah. just want to figure it out. Women seem to be more open and maybe probably more emotionally intelligent to know when they need to like get support from others. 
Yeah, and they cry, they get everything out. They're, they they have a healing process so much better than us. I mean, it's, it's yeah. unbelievable. They also seem to support one another a bit better than we do. Yes, yes. Finding a coach was probably the, the, smart, the, probably the best thing I've done for myself. Um, at the time, I didn't know if I needed a mentor, a therapist. I didn't really know what a coach did. Uh, and, and I went out looking for a therapist and found a coach instead through a friend of mine that, was, that had been going through a really hard time similarly, um, was diagnosed bipolar, and he connected me with a guy. Um, Helga Helberg was my first my first coach that I worked with for about a year and a half, over 50 sessions. And he, he really helped me. The main theme of the thing that we worked on was learning to be relational because I'm very transactional. And as a business owner, that's, that's tough. If, if all you're looking for is the yes, and then you, you're like, okay, check, got that sale done. Don't have to pay attention to them anymore. It's not going to go very far. Yeah, but this comes also from the developers, uh, developers thing like that. I mean, that's, that's something they, okay, check that. Okay. Bye. They, they want to move to the next thing. Yeah. Just want to fix the problem and, and move on to the next thing. When, yeah. Yeah. So working with a coach really like changed my mindset about who I want to be, how I want to have, develop relationships, really learning to do really tough, vulnerable stuff. Um, really like really courageous, which is just like opening your heart, slowing down, um, not always having to fix somebody else's problem, but just like listening to them, showing them that you care. Really what I've learned is that business is highly, highly personal. So when I went, um, my first coach was an executive coach because what I thought was if I can just figure out, if I can feel more financially free, then I'll have more time to do that family stuff and that relationship stuff. But that's bullshit because yeah. if you're not being relational and loving and, and curious with your customers, then you're certainly not doing it with yourself and with your friends and family. So they're all, it's all the same. So out of 50 coaching sessions that I did with Helga, and now I'm working with another coach today, it's all personal intimate relationship stuff that we work on, which benefits my business. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm also very curious about the coach psychologist or psychiatrist, no psychologist uh, relationship because uh, I, I never used one and I, I'm thinking about going to a psychiatrist, no <laughs> psychologist. I don't know which one it is. Mm -hmm. The guy that you sit on the couch and you talk about your problems. That's yeah. Yeah. Psychiatrist. Uh, psychiatrist, right. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, one, one thing that right now, let's, let's say that something... Like when that happened to you, I'm sorry, the, the failure, the, the thing with the company. Mm -hmm. um, did you start to blame people or blame yourself or... What was, I'm just, just curious about this. Uh, did you blame yourself or other people or did you not blame anybody? Um, I think my habit is to blame myself first. Right. That's my default, blame myself. And then when I'm feeling really down, then I turn my attention outward. So once I'm like really low and I need to pick myself back up, then I'll start to point fingers elsewhere. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, about the, the family, because I also, you lose people when you start a business. I don't know. I mean, you, you give all that time into the business and you don't have time for the, you know, for the loved ones and so on. And um, this is a big problem because we keep on wanting new stuff. I mean, even if the business goes well, then it's even worse for the people around you because you're putting more time and you're like 5% from the next dream. And it, it seems to never... I think you don't have time for, for everything. And um, I don't know, do you have that figured out now? I mean, can you compartmentize this? I mean, uh, this is time for family. This is your discipline in that way or working on that or how? Like also living and uh, doing business at the same time. That's That's a big challenge for me at least. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think that's even more 
um, globally, I think that's affecting many more people, the world perhaps right now, because everyone's, a lot of people are working from home. I've been, this is my home office. My bedroom is across the hallway there. So I've been in this mode where I'm working from home and needing to separate out work, work from life, so to speak. That's something that I didn't do a good job of when I, when I was in my marriage. Um, setting boundaries, n knowing um, how to just, I think a lot of it too comes down to you, like you said earlier, being sure of yourself, giving yourself time. I think probably the thing that entrepreneurs struggle with the most is feeling like you're on the clock, right? So you set an expectation by 2022, I want to be making, I want the company to be making a million dollars a year. And from that, I want to make, pay myself a hundred thousand and have five employees. And you set all these things and it's good to have goals. But I think the, the tricky part about goals is the, the feeling of failure if you don't hit those. So goals are good, but I think also being fair with yourself and being realistic and being patient with yourself to say, okay, I didn't get to a million dollars, but I did, I did get to half a million. I did hire these three great people. So celebrating the wins along the way, and that's important. instead of just moving the goalposts, that's an expression that we use in the States all the time. It's like you set this goal and then you reach the goal. Maybe you didn't do it in 12 months. Maybe you did it in 20 months. So you beat yourself up about the time frame, and you forget about all the things that you actually did do in that process. Because in, in, in the process of me making a million dollars for new haircut, I've also learned a million things about how to build a business, how to hire people, how to get myself in front of big companies. I work with these huge companies. I'm just a, a, just a person, which I've never been able to do 10 years ago. So, you know, like celebrating those wins along the way and being patient with yourself. Gary Vaynerchuk always talks about like, forget about the clock. Forget about like this magical timeline that you created in your head about when you should be successful, about like people going into business when they're 40, 60, 80 years old. Yeah, that's, so that's very learning important. Learning to be patient with yourself is patient with yourself and then loving and kind as well. You know, I do each morning, we could talk about like morning routine. Each morning I wake up and I meditate, I stretch, I do like 15 minutes of exercise. And then lately I've been doing this mantra to myself about just like, may I be happy, may I be loving and kind to myself. Like it's just, I'm, I'm it's reminding important. myself out loud that like, it's okay if I'm, oh, if I'm nice to myself. I used, to be, um, I used to be proud to say I'm my own worst critic. I, I said that like with a badge of honor that I was like really hard on myself. And I thought that that, that was like, a proud moment. And I've realized that I was just like, man, if I'm beating myself up, who am I being nice to? Who am I really like building a relationship with? Yes. Yes. So true. <clears throat> okay. Well, one other very big problem. I mean, I'm just going to ask you that companies have like very shitty companies, <laughs> let's say, um, you know, everybody thinks that they can do it. If they push it long enough, we can make it. I mean, just they don't know when to stop. Basically, that's that's the problem. That's the issue. Even if the products really sucks, even if the company sucks, even if everything, you know, they look at these major companies that you know didn't make it for seven years, and in the eighth year they did it, and they go way beyond bank bankrupt. I mean, they borrow money, they do all this stuff. You basically you cannot stop. So, I don't know. Do you have any advice here for for people to stop? I mean, that's. I, I, I've only seen people stop when they run out of money and their family ran out of money. So nobody stops until there is nothing left. And then they pick up the pieces. But I don't know, maybe look at some metrics. Uh, I have no idea. But I know how it is from the inside. I, I, I couldn't have stopped. If somebody would, would come to me and said, look, man, you have to stop this. You're not making it. You're not making enough money. It's you know, look, your girlfriend is going to leave right now. Why, why do you keep, keep on doing this? I mean, but I don't think any outside voice could have, you know, could have done anything for me. I mean, it, it was clear that I have to do this. And, and what I'm trying to do here is to, I don't know, maybe find some sort of 
you know, advice for, for people who are in this situation, which is very common. I mean, a lot of people fail, but the problem is not that they fail. They fail very hard. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be your girlfriend leaving or breaking up. or You don't have to go all that way until, and, um, you know, maybe there is something that we can do about this. And, yeah. Well, I think that a lot of companies fail with their products and services because they don't start the right way. I think a lot of people um, have a vision of what they want to build and they don't really, a, a couple things, they don't really enroll the, the, the true support of other people. They just, um, you know, a lot of the clients that I work with, they'll start with a solution in mind. And my job is to help them back up into understanding the problem that they're trying to solve. Because when you, when you ask questions and you talk about problems that you're trying to work through, that invites other people to feel like they can help and participate and get creative. When you just say like, this is what I want you to do. That's it. It's just a one, it's just one direction. And so you start off with this mindset of it has to be this way. And I work with, I work with mostly larger companies, but even those like managing directors and people, a lot of the complaints they have is I have to do everything. I have to make all the decisions, but that's because that's how they started the relationship by saying like, it has to be this way. It has to be my way because I'm right. And I know, and then they can't, um, they can't detach themselves from every decision being made in every conversation. So if they started differently, like whenever I, I run any kind of workshop or any kind of program, I start with the people in the room by saying like, what's important to you? What is success going to look like? When, to your point, what would it look like for us to fail? And you know, like when you start from that mindset before you're way attached like once you're three months three years in you're too emotionally attached there's too much pride in Come stopping on. but if you start to say like what do we where do we want to get to and what will it look like if we fail i think you give yourself permission to look at that and say like you know we said if this if these things happen it means we made it but if these things happen it means we failed so it's not like you're surprised that you're failing or someone has to tell you you fail. You tell yourself, this is what success looks like. This is what failure looks like. I think it's a very different way to start than by just like putting your blinders on and running downhill for three years only to see like it's not working. And that's what most people do. <laughs> I mean, they put the thing and start running. Yeah. yeah. Also in the companies, I also work with a lot of companies who are doing design sprints, running design sprints. Also, I'm using your app, by the way. I have been using it since the beginning. Uh, Duco. Yeah, because it's it's very comfortable. I mean, you just look at the app. I forget all the questions, everything, but I always have there. I, I read the book. Even in the first sprint, I think I went with your app. It was very easy. Oh, cool. So just remind myself of the things. That nobody in the room knew what I'm doing on my phone. So I was the facilitator and... Yeah, so I still have it installed. It's, I, I use it from time to time. But uh, right now, it's only remote design with sprints. Um, yeah. It's a different mindset. You know, it's, it's very generative. It's, um, I always tell people, uh, when they say, what will be the deliverables of working together? If, if I help them facilitate a design sprint. And I'm like, well, you're in the digital space. So we're going to have some prototypes. We're going to have some interviews. We're going to record stuff. We're going to have visual artifacts that come out of it. Great. All tangibles that you're going to get. I said, but the more important thing for you to be aware of are the outcomes. And that's going to be the shift in terms of how you talk to one another, how you negotiate, how you share ideas, how you build on top of one person's idea into something new and different and big and bold that like, separate you weren't able to see but together you're able to which is very different than right, there's a simple activity that i do with a lot of groups um called yes and and yes but it's an improv exercise and you just have a conversation using yes but um and it feels like you're constantly defensive with one another and chopping each other's legs out and then you just change the butt with the and and just that simple change in using and instead of but it feels like you're yeah. Kind of, even if you don't agree with the person's idea, you could be like, yeah, and we can also do this, right? And then that person feels heard. 
such a simple thing. Yeah. Um, I always tell the story. I, I shared that exercise with a group in San Francisco and they were like, we're going to use yes. And every time from now on. And then I counted 77 butts over the next three days. And I shared with the, that with them, not to make them feel bad about themselves, but to help them see that like, this is the, like language and human interaction and how we are, how we operate in group dynamics. This is something that we've been learning since we were little kids. So don't expect to change and don't expect to innovate how you operate as a group of people in a day or in a workshop. People think like oh, we did the design thinking workshop. Now we're design thinkers, but design thinking is just a way of being. It's like a language and a set of, it's a mindset itself. So give yourself patience with that, with process like that as well. Great. So <clears throat> to get back, it's like the start is very important in a, in a business. And also in the corporate corporations that I work with, uh, fear of failure, it's a big thing. Like now they are pressured to innovate all the time. And look, look, we have to innovate. We have to do something better than the competition and so on. And uh, they come from a background. I don't know. It's, this is how it's here in Romania. I don't know. Maybe in, in America, it's something different. But um, here, they people don't want to rock the boat people who work in a corporation they they this is how they were brought up this is how this is how things work and all of a the sudden they said look now you have to rock the boat you have to come up with new stuff you have to i don't know and what's happening here it's like this people know that even if you succeed with something the credit is going to go to the manager if you fail i'm going to be blamed so there is no they don't feel safe to try things because it's like that. I mean, the credit is going to go to the upper management. And if everything goes wrong and you tell me to try to risk, it's going to be on me. I know that it's going to be on me. So is there, is there a way that we can, I don't know, they can feel safe. I, I try. I mean, I've done I Love Failure uh, events where upper management comes and talks about, you know, look, we failed. We, we, we realized that until now things were like this, but maybe we can change it. Like, look, we also failed and we're not going to blame you for whatever you're doing. Let's, let's try, let's keep on experimenting. Let's they try to change the mindset of the company somehow. I love failure is just one way, but um, basically they're very, they're afraid of failing. That's, that's what's happening in the, in the companies and they do not want to try. And even if they try, they try small things like nothing major, nothing that can, you know, uh, affect the the company in a major way because they don't want to risk it. You know, they don't they want to go out of their way with this. So, yeah. any advice here on on how to with the teams, how to manage a team like this? Let's say uh, there's a new team for a product, and uh, how would you go about making them feel safe to experiment? Of course, you need upper management approval, but even that. Yeah. Well. Um... I'll say this. It's been a long time since I had a job with a, a true boss. You could argue that my clients are my boss, of course. Um, so it's easier for me to say as a consultant that teaches people these things and coach other people that are, so I do a bit of coaching myself these days. Um, and I go back to that idea of being at cause or, or being at effect, right? So you can complain that the company the company and the executives and everybody other than you are afraid of failure and have created this environment where it's not okay to fail. And you may work in a company where it's, it's risky to stick your head up, but at what cost is that coming to you? So you have to start to ask yourself the question, is it worth staying with that team and with that company? And if it is, what do you want to do to change the conversation? Because if you just want to continue to complain, then nothing's going to change and you're just going to stay. And that's going to feel like um, inauthentic to who you're trying to be as a person, as an employee, as a manager, maybe to other people. In the end, you wind up recreating the same environment. When you become a leader, you, now you you have people that are reporting to you that don't feel safe to stick their necks out. So I also think that I think how you look at the situation and what you can do to take responsibility to change the dynamic. And it doesn't mean that you have to argue with people. So the, the, one of the reasons that I probably got myself pushed out and fired from companies is because I thought that change meant arguing. 
and it meant I'm right and you're wrong. But now if I were to go back to me 10 years ago, 15 years ago and say, what can I do to be curious? Instead of being right, how can I be curious about the situation? Why is, why is it like this today? Are you ha like manager, uh, senior VP? Are you happy with the way that things work today? Because chances are they don't like how it is either. But if you label them as the one that's doing it and they're the problem and they need to go and you're, you're right, there's, that's probably not going to go very far in terms of a conversation. But if you go at it with a, more of a curious mindset, how is this working? How do you feel about it? Do we want to change it? How can I help? Right? It's just a very different way to, to, to hold space, to hold um, a, a kind of dialogue between you and another person. Okay, so it starts... Way. It starts with the guys from I and mean, the guys from the team starting different conversations with the management and vice versa. They they have to start to talk to each other. Yeah, and you can model it too. You know, like I think um, me, like everybody else, I'm guilty of wanting things. Like if I put a little bit of energy into something, I want it to be perfect after one try. And so what that, what does that mean? Probably that means that you don't invest your energy in a lot of things because you're attached to the outcome. Yeah. It also means that you have unrealistic expectations and you should probably look at those because most things that require a big shift are going to take lots of persistence, lots of, lots of curiosity, lots of patience, and you're just going to have to try it over and over and over again. But the more that you model what you want to be, right? Like the famous Gandhi quote, be the change you want to see in the world. The more that you spend time modeling how you want things to go and just doing it in small experiments. So maybe you don't raise your hand and say, this, this is wrong. This sucks. I'm going to take these 10 people and do it differently. You're probably off to a bad start. But if you have that kind of curious conversation to say, and say, you know, I'm going to do little experiments and I'm going to let you know how it goes. Because if we're both committed to seeing things go differently in this way, I'm going to do a couple experiments and I'm going to report back what I noticed in terms of what changed. That's now you're enrolling people into it instead of like commanding that things be different and that you're the, the right one. Yes. Yes. Much better. Um, okay. So, do you have any book recommendations, some books that influenced you over the years? Yeah, I that... do. I do. I happen to have some books right here. Um, okay, so I've got, um, for me, for the 28-year-old the, the me um, that's listening to this, that's like working when things get back to normal, you're like sitting in a cube, you feel like you're just a cog in the wheel and you're, you're curious to like maybe get promoted or start your own company. Um, I read a book a long time ago called Escape from Cubicle Nation. Um, I don't even remember it to say that I would recommend it, but I did read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the, the CEO, well, the former CEO and founder of Nike. And what I appreciated most, most from, from his story was this, very similar to this conversation, none of his journey was easy. It was really, really hard. He was an accountant. He was like teaching accounting while building his company, like flying to Japan to sell a Japanese shoe manufacturer that there was like a, a company called Nike back in the States. Um, and just nothing was clear to him. Like there was no, this is working. I'm going to continue to follow this. And it, I've got it all figured out. Like who he worked with, where he got product from, who he sold to, how he survived and how he made money, um, who he enrolled support from. No, like nothing that he did was calculated that I'm going to do it. It worked the first time and I'm going to continue doing that. It was like so many setbacks and he just, he persisted through it. It's a really inspiring story. He lost his son. Oh, inspiring, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he lost his son at one point. Like he went through a lot. Um, and it took a really long time for Nike to become the company that we know Nike is today. A really long, most of the book is about all these years that he spent building and building and building. You look at Nike and you're like Michael Jordan, yeah. LeBron James. 
Williams, you know, all these like, but it took years for him to be, to outcompete Adidas and all that he did so that they would be his brand reps. It took a lot of work. So as far as like being an entrepreneur and getting through challenges, Shoe Dog is a great read. Um, right. That's one. Uh, while I was in, in particular going through a lot of personal pain in my life from like divorce and just like my whole life changed with my kids, everything. I read, I started reading a lot of work by Brene Brown. Um, you really, you could pick up any book that she's written or you could just watch her TED talk. Um, on She's a shame researcher. So she talks about, um, she studied shame for the last 20 or 30 years or so. And what she learned is that people who are wholehearted really like have a loving sense of who they are and who, who they want to be as a person are more open to joy, which is really, it's, um, it seems really easy, but it also seems so overwhelmingly easy that it's really painful to think about that you are in control of all the happiness that you allow yourself to experience. Yeah. And the vulnerable, more vulnerable you are, and the more open and wholehearted, the more joy is going to come into, into your life. Um, so I've read all of her books. She's written, I think, may, I haven't read all of her books. I've read about five of her books. I think Braving the Wilderness, um, they all have this theme about like going through challenges and getting back up, like standing back up and, and continuing on. Um, and they you know, read uh, Rising Strong from her. In Rising Strong, great, yeah. yeah. It's right. Um, if you're more, if you want to, if you're a business, business executive that's watching this talk and you want to give something to your team, that's more work appropriate, even though I think that's bullshit. I think this all applies to work because it applies to being a good, a good human. There is a book. Her latest book is called uh, Daring to, Dare to Lead, which is more about like applying vulnerability and all these principles in a work setting. But all of her other books are great too. So Braving the Wilderness, um, the one that you mentioned, her TED Talk. Watch her TED Talk. It's 20 minutes and she talks a lot about that. She's a great storyteller. I've yet to listen or read any of her stuff without crying. Um, just really like hits home. And then the last one that I was going to recommend today is a book called How to Be Yourself by Dr. Ellen Hendrickson. Um, so I've always, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I've always um, considered myself to be more introverted, but being a business owner and being a facilitator, being a trainer, a coach, um, you can be introverted, but it also depends on if you use introversion as a gift that you have, like a deep thinker, or if it's something that you beat yourself up over. If you're trying to be an extrovert and trying to be, charismatic and be that sort of like visionary leader, like the Steve jobs or something like that, then you're not going to be, you're not going to, you're going to forget about all the gifts you have as an introvert. Also, there's a subtle distinction between introversion and social anxiety and being shy really. And, and most of the time we confuse those two things. So her book helped me to understand the difference between being shy and being introverted. And what I learned is that I'm actually more of an ambivert. So I have times that I'm more extroverted, times that I'm more introverted, but I'm just generally, I can be shy. Um, and that just comes from fear of failure, fear of performance, fear of like all these stories that we make up about what other people are expecting of us. And just learning to know that that's just a story in my head that I've created. My, my monkey to... my monkey's crazy, man. It's just blah, blah, blah all the time. I, I used to do stand-up comedy. It, it got me off stage. I mean, it was so bad to me. Nobody in, this, in the audience would have done anything as worse as my, my monkey. You're worse. You're the worst. Why are you here? Just get the fuck down. Don't sit there. Why, what, what, what are you telling those people? So my monkey was, well, well out of yeah. control. Out of control. So. And the, the great news for people that are, are shy, that's all learned. You, you learn that yourself from trauma, from something that happened to you. So you can unlearn anything that you learned, which is great. Introversion is not something to unlearn. It's just a personality style of who you are. It doesn't mean that you're going to be like quiet in the corner and that 
that is a bad thing. Introverts just wouldn't go to the party because they prefer like quiet, intimate settings. If the idea of a party or, or doing stand-up comedy scares the shit out of you, that's just something that you can unlearn because most of it comes down to being like fear of being seen. And, and that's actually like, you feel like your face is purple and maybe the person in the audience looked at you for a split second and said like, oh, he seems a little nervous. That's kind of endearing. That's it. And then they're like, what am I going to have for dinner? In our heads, yeah. that person thinks we're terrible. We should never, they don't even care about us. They just care about themselves. And they're going to forget like five seconds after you get off stage, even if you bomb, it's going to be okay, fuck it. And let's go drink. Like yeah. I saw this comic. He wasn't that good. Maybe he'll be good some other time. I don't even know. I forget his name. That's it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. You and you keep on amplifying that night in your head, and it's it's unbelievable. To me, it led to a nervous breakdown. I mean, after one set, it I, it went so so hard. Uh, I could not even sit in a room with people and put a question to the guy speaking. So no. I was really fucked up. And uh, right now I'm speaking in front of 200 people. There's no problem. That's, but I, it took a long time to get back on, and not to. Uh, to listen to the voice, I also meditate and I do a lot of things where I kind of let it go. Okay, it's the monkey. Okay, just just move on. And it's very important to have control over that. It's Yeah, I had a conversation with, with Dr. Ellen afterward because I wrote an article and now I'm working on a series of, of other content, maybe even toolkits for like introverted facilitators and leaders. Um, and she told, well, I learned it in the book and we then we had a conversation about it most people f fool themselves into believing that you're confident first and then you do confident things. That's not how it works. You do confident things that are really scary and really awkward and then you become confident by watching yourself do those actions. So yeah. you have to try, you have to be uncomfortable. The more, yeah. more vulnerable you are means the more alive you are. So do the, do the stuff that's really hard and eventually it's not as hard just getting over that initial hump. Yes, so true. Okay, Jay, thanks for uh, for coming today on the I Love Failure show. Uh, here we're trying to change people's relationship with failure, you know, like try more. It doesn't matter if you fail, get up, and all, all sorts of things. And um, it was uh, it was really nice talking to you today. Yeah, same here, thanks for having me. I'll just say one last thing. The, my favorite quote that Brene Brown may have borrowed from Star Wars or somewhere else as like talking about failure and challenge is just remind yourself that the only way out is through. Like the hardest thing that you have to do is often the, the, the best path forward. Push through right. all that uncomfortable stuff. It's so important. Everybody talks about this. I mean, Joe Rogan, a lot of people like getting uncomfortable, uncomfortable is part of um, yeah, I hope I hope we, we can, you know, especially with the thing that you're trying to do with the introvert facilitators, I think it's a huge problem. I've seen a lot of people, I have, I manage a lot of these designers, and uh, I always said, look, why, why don't you want to facilitate, like, get, no, 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 I, I prefer to just do on my computer the stuff, but I, I know she's curious, she wants to, but... Me too, that, that's where I started. I never imagined that I'd be at the front of the room, ever. <laughs> Here I am. Okay. Thanks, 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 Jay, for for coming, and uh, maybe we'll talk soon on on this show. Maybe we continue the conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me. Okay, bye.